Okay, off we go. Um, let's talk a little bit about the schedule. Uh, hopefully you found Sam Kriegman's work uh, interesting last week. As far as we know, uh, Sam and his colleagues are the first to use an evolutionary algorithm to design a living system. It's not a robot, it's not an organism. He's looking for a name for these things. Did you guys give him a name? Robot. Robot? Robot. A Grobot, that's pretty good. Okay, all right. So you saw it here first, folks. Whatever this third form of living system is, uh, you can use an evolutionary algorithm to design them. Okay, so back to robots today. We're going to uh, continue on our discussion about the intimate connection between getting from point A to point B and cognition. Movement and cognition seem to be intimately connected, and we'll see a little bit more of that today. We'll probably finish lecture 11 today and move on to lecture 12, where we'll look in a little more depth at our particular form of locomotion, which is bipedal locomotion, and attempts to try and get machines to move in that way. And then uh, maybe on Thursday or next week, we'll start in on some of the open challenges or the open problems in the field. As I mentioned several times now, evolutionary robotics is a relatively new field. There are a lot of open questions that no one has a good answer to, and that's one of the things that I think makes this field particularly interesting. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, the assignments. So uh, graduate students, I think I met with each of you, and it sounds like you all have a pretty good project uh, idea in mind. This week, you're going to be working on your second weekly report, which you'll submit next Monday night as usual. And in that second weekly report, you can just type a couple sentences directly into Blackboard saying, recall that my first uh, weekly deliverable or my first, week, in my first weekly deliverable was to implement X. I worked on X and found out that that was a little bit unreasonable. I've altered X into Y. And here are a couple of images or a 30 second video demonstrating Y. Like I mentioned before, we don't stick, we don't assume that you're going to stick slavishly to all the seven or eight uh, stepping stones that you outlined this week. What you're trying to show us between now and the end of the semester is that you've got your final project in mind and as you're working your way through these deliverables, you're continuously refactoring and breaking this problem down into weekly bite-sized chunks, telling us very succinctly in one or two sentences what this week's weekly bite-sized chunk is and what we should be looking for in the images or video that demonstrate that you've implemented X correctly. Sound good? Pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, for the undergraduates, you're moving on to assignment uh, seven. And in assignment seven, you're going to be turning your serial hill climber into a parallel hill climber. We're dropping now a number of points in parallel onto the surface of a fitness landscape. Each of those points, each of those parents produce a single child. And if that child is better than its parent, it replaces the parent otherwise the child is deleted and a new child uh, is made. As you might have guessed from the name, the Parallel Hill Climber, um, you can in fact parallelize your search algorithm at this point. And uh, it's in the instructions here at step, it's down here somewhere. It's a relatively long assignment, so get started early. Step number 55 talks about how to parallelize your evolutionary algorithm. And here's a video of my attempt to do this. I'm going to start up my parallel hill climber down here and when I do it's going to start up five PyroSim simulations in parallel. At this point I have the graphics turned on so it'll open five separate graphics windows and you can see all five of these different controllers running in parallel. Pretty straightforward thing uh, to do. Uh, depending on your laptop, uh, it's obviously going to be somewhat computationally intensive, so you may be able to open more or less simulations in parallel. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter. It's up to you how many you want to run. Here it was 5, 10, 2, doesn't, doesn't really matter. Okay, that's assignment uh, 7. Uh, any questions about assignment 6 or any of the other assignments? Final projects? All good? Okay. Back to lecture. So uh, lecture 11 talking about legged locomotion. We just touched on this last time and what I left you with to think about was 
any form of locomotion in air, in water, on land is always a balance between at least four competing objectives. Displacement itself, how far you can get. Robustness, how many different landscapes can you move over successfully. How much energy do you, do you require to move from point A to point B. And finally, stability. What are some examples of all the different ways that Mother Nature has discovered to get animals from point A to point B, where those balances are struck in different ways? Some particular more modes of locomotion favor one or two of these objectives at the expense of others, and vice versa. Brachiation, which is very fast, but very unstable. <laughs> very fast but very unstable if you make a mistake, right? There's a few primate species that are pretty good at brachiation. This particular primate species, we're not very good at it. Could practice and get better. Not as good as gibbons. Make one mistake and you're in trouble. True. Other examples? Okay, so moving over land, which we'll talk about uh, a fair bit here. This is a good one to put up here. Why, why did uh, Mother Nature ever evolve away from snakes or reptilian locomotion? What's the drawback of slithering or moving over a surface? It's energy intensive. It's energy intensive. Why? You take a huge hit in energy if you're moving along the ground. Increasing friction. Increasing friction, right? So as, long, as soon as there's friction, you're losing a lot of energy as waste heat. There is another reason why this particular mode of locomotion is energy inefficient. You're not taking advantage of gravity like you do with bipedal locomotion. Exactly. As we're going to see when we focus in in a few minutes on legged locomotion and then bipedal locomotion, in mammalian species all of the legs are vertical relative to the ground. In most reptilian and amphibian species the legs are horizontal, right? And you can obviously feel this if you put your arm out parallel to the ground. You're, exp you're expending energy keeping your, your arm up there. Of course, if you're moving along the ground, you're resting your horizontally angled legs on the ground, but you gotta lift them up and move them forward. It's very energy uh, intensive. What's the benefit? Can't fall. Can't fall, right? No problem with with stability. Okay, so uh, again, as we, as we think about locomotion, it's good to keep these four uh, aspects of locomotion in mind and think about the different ways that uh, animals, and in a moment, robots strike a balance between these different objectives, these different competing objectives. Okay, so again, with reptilian uh, locomotion, you're dragging your body, and also you have these horizontally angled legs that require a fair bit of uh, energy, so you cannot exploit the passive swing of a vertically angled leg. If you remember back towards the beginning of the course when we talked about embodied cognition, embodied cognition is the idea that your body is a tool with which you interact with the world, and if evolution is acting on bodies, either biological bodies or machine bodies, evolution can find ways to exploit those bodies. It can exploit the, in, the physical interactions between body and environment. Okay. Okay, so we're going to again look at animal locomotion for the next few slides and then build up a little bit of intuition about how movement works in the animal kingdom and try and apply that to robots. Um, biomechanics is a fascinating uh, subject. We're just going to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, biomechanics is trying to understand how different animal species strike this balance between energy, stability, displacement, uh, and robustness. How do we do that? Well, we need to obviously understand energy expenditure as well. So uh, often what is done in animal studies is to try and study the difference in CO2 and oxygen as the animal uh, breathes out. You could do that either with larger animals where they wear a mask, and this is, you've probably seen human athletes doing this wearing a VO2 mask, uh, VO2 max mask. The more energy that your body is burning, the more calories that they're burning, the more oxygen that's required to keep that fire going. So when you breathe in, you take in a, a fixed amount of oxygen. And when you breathe out, you can look at the delta in the amount of oxygen you breathed in and the amount that came out. It's a little more complicated than that. 
but generally we're looking to try and estimate the amount of energy that an animal is expending over some interval of time, obviously while it's moving. So we put the animal on a treadmill or the human on a treadmill or the human on a stationary bike and measure indirectly the amount of energy that they're using. Okay, so if we do studies like this, we can usually then start to relate the total amount of energy that they're using, the particular gait that they're using, and other aspects of, of locomotion. So let's have a look at one of these studies to begin with. This is among humans. So here's an example of a whole bunch of humans, uh, adult males I think in this case, uh, that were walking on a treadmill at different speeds on the horizontal axis here, and then they were estimating, probably using VO2 uh, max, the amount of energy expenditure as they walked or ran. What happens in terms of energy as adult males walk and run at different speeds? The point at which running is more efficient than walking. Exactly, right? So at <laughs> slow speeds, obviously walking is pretty uh, efficient and it's uh, more efficient than running. But at some point, there is a nonlinear relationship that kicks in so that if you wish to move at faster and faster speeds, walking becomes increasingly uncomfortable, which you probably all experience. And that uncomfortableness is related to this use of energy. And so most adult males or females will instinctually switch to running if they wish to move at a faster gait. So already we notice that there is this relationship between speed of travel, gait, the form that you move, and energy. It's not an obvious, it's not a simple linear relationship. There are these nonlinear uh, relationships. If you remember back to the beginning of last week when we were looking at the arm robot that was performing active categorical perception and we did this thought experiment about rolling your palm along the top of objects and we sort of saw this magic appear where we have a continuous interaction with the world. The world is analog, we are analog, but because of that interaction sometimes interactions congeal into discrete categories like slidable objects and rollable objects, same thing starts to happen as we move about in our environment. Given our particular biomechanics, there seem to be these discrete bins in which if you wish to move at a certain speed, one particular discrete gait makes more sense than another. Right? You've probably seen videos of speed walkers that are trying to walk at a very fast speed or run at a slow speed, and it usually looks humorous. Why does it look humorous? Why is it funny to watch someone speed walk it? At least it is to me. What's happening? Well, they're swinging their hips a lot and have really long strides. Exactly. So they're trying to adapt. They're, they're trying to tweak walking to move at a certain speed. And it often looks funny because most of the time when you're observing other humans moving, However fast or slow they're moving, they're usually using the gait that's appropriate for it because obviously, if you wish to move at a certain speed, you're going to use the most energy efficient movement. So humor is all about breaking expectations. In the rare case where you see someone walking at a very fast speed, it breaks your expectation that humans, like most other animals, want to travel in the most energy efficient manner. Right? Okay. Here's another example of the relationship between gait, particular gait, mode of uh, uh, rate of speed, and total energy expenditure. So in this plot here, they asked, uh, again, I think it was uh, the same group of adult males to walk in this case, so just one gait, but to walk with different stride frequencies. So big, slow strides, or lots of small, fast strides. What happens in this case? Seems like the best, most efficient stride rate is once per second. Pretty much. So now when you leave class today, pay attention to your footfalls, which you may or may not have done before. Most of you will take steps at about one step per second. Depending on your height, uh, it'll be a little bit faster, a little bit slower, but for most adult uh, humans, one stride per second 
seems to be about optimal, right? Okay. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's humans. What about animals? Well, obviously, we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about gait. Depending on how many legs you have and depending on your particular anatomy, there are more or less gaits available to you. For humans, there's basically two, walking and running. For horses, there's actually more than three. Any horse people here? How many gaits? Four, I guess five. Ah, pacing. four. Sometimes pacing is a fifth one. There are Icelandic horses, a particular strain of horses that have a sixth gait called tulting. You can go have some fun on YouTube later today by looking at uh, Icelandic horse gates. Uh, again, things get pretty complicated. Depending on how fast an equine species or an equine wants to travel, it will move at a faster or slower uh, pace. We're going to introduce a little bit of terminology today just to, to um, be able to talk a little bit more clearly about locomotion. When, uh, when an animal is moving, we can talk about the gait cycle. And the gait cycle is the period of time during which the animal walks and goes back to where they started. So for a human, a gait cycle is left foot down, right foot off, right foot swings forward, right foot strikes, left foot leaves the ground, left foot swings forward, hits the ground, I finish my gait cycle. Right, left, that's one gait cycle. For a horse, obviously it's going to be foot one, foot two, foot three, foot four, that's a gait cycle, and then it's gonna strike with foot one again. During any one gait cycle, during that time period, we can ask the question of, is there a stance phase and a flight phase? How much of the time during that single gait cycle is the animal on the ground, and how much time is it off the ground? So in my little cartoon here, you'll notice that in this particular part of the gait cycle for trotting, the horse is actually, uh, at least one foot is in contact with the ground. So periods, time periods during the gait cycle when at least one foot is on the ground, that's stance phase. If the animal is airborne for any part of the gait cycle, that is uh, the flight phase. And the reason I picked the horses here is because the very first movie was made over 100 years ago to answer the question of whether during trotting or galloping a horse actually leaves the ground. If you watch a horse trotting, it can be very difficult to visually determine whether there is a period during which all four feet were off the ground. Uh, so Professor Moybridge at MIT at the time over 100 years ago came up with this way of creating moving pictures over time and took a recording of a horse to try and answer that, that question. All right, just a little bit of biomechanics trivia for you. This is a, a nice video I found of uh, dog gates, not that different from horse gates, obviously. And you can see the very different ways that uh, quadrupeds have come up with moving for moving at different speeds. Which of these six has a flight phase? Canter and gallop for sure. Again, trotting is a little bit difficult to tell, right? There, there may be a very short period during the gait cycle in which all four feet are off the ground. If you have a dog at home, take him or her in the backyard and get them to run around and see if you can spot the stance in the flight phase. Not always an easy thing to do. Okay, so we have gait cycle, stance phase, flight phase. We can then, remember one of the four uh, competing objectives during locomotion is stability. We can ask the question, how stable is the animal at any time? How likely is it to fall over or disrupt its gait and have to recover its gait and so on? We can actually talk about two different forms of stability, which are static stability and dynamic stability. Static stability is pretty straightforward. Static stability is the idea of that if you ever stop moving or the animal stops moving at any point in time, its momentum will not continue uh, its direction of movement. It will stay still and not fall over. During walking, most of the time, you are statically stable. If you stop moving at any time, you won't fall over. That is not true during running. The, the particular gait of human running is not statically stable. If you're running and you stop moving, 
you're going to have an accident, right? Okay. Dynamic stability is a little bit more complicated, it's the ba but the intuition makes sense. The idea is once you get into the rhythm of a gait, if there is a perturbation to that, if you slip a little bit on the ice or you step on a stone or something else perturbs you, you will return to the rhythm of the gait. You might get knocked out of your rhythm temporarily, but you'll return to that uh, gait. We'll see an example of dynamic stability in a moment. How do we know whether an animal or a robot is statically stable? Well, of course, we could ask it to stand still and see whether it falls over or not. We can actually determine it, however, if we know the animal or the robot's center of mass and its polygon of support. So at any point in time during the gait cycle, assuming at least one foot is on the ground, at least assuming there's a period during which it is, uh, there is a stance phase, we can take all of the points of contact on the ground and connect them with lines to create a polygon. And if the center of mass is vertically centered within that polygon of support, the animal or the robot is statically stable. Right? So as I'm walking, my feet are creating a parallelogram of support. And as long as my center of mass is inside that parallel parallelogram as I move, I'm statically stable, right? So running is not statically stable because of course there is a flight phase. There is a period in which there is no polygon of support, so your center of mass can't be within it. You're not statically stable. Okay. So here's an example of statically unstable. If you have an animal that's moving with its two left legs on the ground and then its two right feet on the ground, sorry, two left to right feet on the ground and so on, obviously it's statically unstable. Some of you in your final project, you're going to be looking at uh, different ways in which your, your robot may move, and these concepts of polygon of support may <clears throat> become interesting to you. You can compute the polygon of support within PyroSim by putting position sensors in the feet. Remember, position sensors give you back X, Y, and Z. If you also put touch sensors in the feet, you'll know when those feet are in contact with the ground. And if you collect back all of that touch information and position information about the feet over time, you can actually compute the polygon of support. Computing the center of mass is a little bit more difficult. There's no center of mass sensor. However, if you put position sensors in each object making up the robot, you can, you can start to figure out center of mass. Right? Just sort of things to think about. Another thing to think about as we talk about different gates is all of the work you've been doing in the assignments so far, your fitness function has been pretty simple. It just selects for displacement. How might you go about changing your fitness function to be a little bit more specific? How might you select for a particular kind of gate? How would you evolve a robot to trot or canter? You could make a fitness function that focuses only a few feet on the ground at one time. Exactly, right? So with just touch sensors alone, if you put them in the feet, using the time series data from the touch sensors, you can actually reward not just for displacement, but for particular ways of moving. For those that are interested in biomechanics and gates, might be an interesting thing to, to try. Okay. That's animals. Let's look at robots. Uh, let's look at one particular robot, which is Big Dog. And Big Dog was famous for lots of reasons about 10 years ago. But at least among roboticists, Big Dog was famous because it finally solved more or less the dynamic stability problem. You'll notice that Big Dog has a particular gait that it's moving with. And depending uh, on the terrain that it's moving over, it's being pushed out of that rhythm of its gait, and its controller is gradually pulling it back into the rhythm of that gait. It's able to recover from slight perturbations to the gait caused by the ground over which it's moving. You can hear Big Dog making its noise as it moves. There's a pretty big perturbation. You can see how far outside its normal rhythm it moves and is able to recover. This robot is very dynamically stable. 
It's a perfect video for today. Some of you may have been doing this on the way into class this morning. Big dogs carrying 325 pounds on its back. Not something I recommend while you're trying to move over these terrains. You'll notice that it also adapts its gait a little bit depending on whether it's traveling uphill or downhill. It's particularly appropriate today. Again, some of us may have been doing this on the way in. Imagine slipping on the ice with 325 pounds on your back. You're probably not gonna recover as gracefully as as Big Dog does. Yes. Was this developed using an evolutionary algorithm? Good question. Was this developed using an evolutionary algorithm? Uh, Big Dog was made by Boston Dynamics, and it's a corporate secret on how this actually uh, works. Um, I know some of the people at, at um, Boston Dynamics. It's not quite an evolutionary algorithm. It's complicated. They brought a lot of different algorithms together. But the heart of the algorithm, the problem that they solved is how does Big Dog know when it's been perturbed from its regular way of moving? And how does it move in a way to recover its original gait, right? I've been perturbed. I'm getting sensor information I never got before. What do I do to get back to being dynamically stable? That was the big problem that was solved with Big Dog. Has everyone seen Big Dog before? And it's little brothers and sisters since then? Okay. Here's Big Dog version 2.0, which came out about a year after Big Dog was released. This is Big Dog Beta. Not quite as good, but not too bad. <laughs> it actually looks like two bipeds in a suit, which is exactly what it is. Okay. <laughs> you know you're making it big in robotics when they make a spoof video of your robot, so there you go. Okay, back to animals for a moment, and then we'll switch back uh, to robots. Uh, let's have a look at ponies for a moment. Um, ponies have more or less three natural gates walking, trotting, and galloping. When they're left to their own devices in the paddock, um, they will periodically switch between walking and trotting and galloping. And when they do, they will do so at these different speeds. So you can see that most legged animals don't travel at a continuum of speeds. There are discrete categories or different speeds at which they prefer to move. And there are discrete, there's a single gait appropriate for that, that speed. So again, when we interact with the world, there is a continuous way in which you could do so, but animals tend not to do so. They congeal into discrete categories of interaction with the environment, which when we're talking about locomotion are gates. They then took these ponies, put them onto very big treadmills, uh, and fed them if they exhibited a desired gait. So they trained these ponies to continue walking or trotting or galloping as the treadmill was sped up or down. If they switched to the gait that felt more comfortable at that lowered or increased speed, no carrot. If they continued on with the gait, the original gait for a little while, carrot. So they could train the ponies to continue to exhibit these gaits, although they didn't really feel very comfortable at those speeds. What happened in this case? Exactly. So there's an energy minimum for all of these gates, as you can see. There's one particular speed at which, for that gate, the ponies spend exert less energy. And surprise, surprise, that energy minimum is the speed that they actually walk at in, in nature, as we all do, right? Kind of makes sense. These energy minima, though, are more or less severe depending on the gait. So the, the point of this slide here is just to remember that energy expenditure, speed, and gait, the relationships between those three are very complicated. 
This is not in, not this does not even touch on the fourth one, which is stability. Okay. So now let's switch to robots. We're going to look at one of my old papers where I was interested in this question about the relationship between uh, speed and energy expenditure as a function of the body. So as we just as we just saw, for different animals, they have different gates. And there are different trade-offs, and obviously the particular form of these trade-offs is dictated by the body. Two-legged animals such as us have two discrete gates that we're comfortable with. Four-legged animals have five or six gates, depending on how you count. So clearly there is a relationship between anatomy, gait, speed, and energy. But if we look at animals, we're limited to the solutions that Mother Nature has, has come up with. Can we instead create different anatomies and study this relationship between speed, stability, uh, and energy with a wider range of options? That's what I wanted to look at in this paper. So to do that, as you can see, uh, in um, Open Dynamics Engine, the physics engine underlying PyroSim, I created these 10 different robots. They all have different body plans. They have more or less objects. If you look carefully, and I'll zoom in on some of these here, you'll notice that different parts of the body are tagged with M, A, and T. Each robot has four T's, which are four touch sensors, four angle sensors, which are the four A's, and eight M's, which are the eight motor neurons. So we have 10 robots with 10 different bodies, but each of the 10 species has exactly the same neural network architecture. Four touch sensors, four angle sensors, three hidden neurons that you see here, and eight motor neurons. We also have an additional bias neuron at the input layer and a second bias neuron at the hidden layer. Have we talked about bias neurons yet? I don't think so. A bias neuron is pretty simple. It just always outputs the same value, positive one in this case. In this neural network like yours, Neurons range between minus one and one. Bias neurons always emit a value of one. Why would we include bias neurons? How are they useful? Any ideas? What if we want um, certain values for certain neurons to tend towards a certain value? If we want certain values to tend towards a certain value, that's pretty close. Or to be generally higher if it's outputting one, for example. That's true. So the bias neurons give evolution a little bit uh, a broader range of options. So one way to think about this is imagine for any of these 10 robots, as they're doing their thing, they get into some situation where none of the touch sensors are firing, and all four of the angle sensors are at about the default angle of zero. So imagine that all eight sensors are firing at about a value of zero. Now I know we have some recurrent connections in here, but let's just ignore the recurrent connections for a moment. Assume you have a feed-forward neural network in which all the sensor neuron values are near zero. What can you tell me about the values at the motor layer? They're going to be vanishingly small, right? So exactly. Remember in a neural network, at the heart of a neural network, we're always taking the source neuron value, multiplying it by a weight, and summing it. If the input layer is all zero, zero times anything, it doesn't matter what the weight, what the weights are from the input layer to the hidden layer, the hidden neurons are going to have values around zero as well. Let's forget about the recurrent connections for a moment. If the hidden neurons all have values around zero, zero times any synaptic weight values between the hidden neurons and the motor neurons also going to be zero. So you can imagine these robots kind of get trapped into certain situations. Um, by adding in a bias neuron, which always outputs a value of one, and if evolution sets the weights of these synapses, evolution can play with the values at the motor layer independent of what's coming in at the input layer. OK, so it just sort of gives a little bit more freedom for, for evolution. OK, so we have these uh, 10 robots. 
They all have exactly the same number of sensors and motors. They have exactly the same neural network architecture. We're going to use exactly the same fitness function to evolve these 10 robots, which is the same fitness function you're using, just maximum displacement, move as fast as possible. And we're going to use exactly the same optimizer or evolutionary algorithm. Details don't really matter. So we've tried to make everything the same among these 10 robots, except the body itself. We're then going to perform 30 evolutionary trials, uh, 30 evolutionary trials with this robot, another 30 evolutionary trials with this robot, this one, and so on. So we're going to do a total of 300 independent trials and ask the question, on average, how easy or hard is it for evolution to get these robots to travel quickly? At the end of the 30 evolutionary trials, are some of these robots moving faster than others? So keep in mind here that we have a simple fitness function. We're not selecting for energy efficiency or stability, just speed. Can't do any gambling in this class, so we'll do this uh, just on the honor system. Which of the 10 do you think is going to end up traveling faster? For those of you that haven't read this paper yet. And why? Or which ones do you think evolution is going to have a harder time getting to move quickly? I guess the quadruped move the fastest. Why, why guess the quadruped? Um, in terms of en energy efficiency that we talked about with um, vertical legs. Right, so they have vertical legs. They might be more energy efficient, but we're not going to use energy in the fitness function. These robots can use as much power as they want to move. The quadruped is a pretty good guess because you're all you've all implemented the quadruped. So it's made it from this paper 17 years ago into today's assignments. You say number nine. Why number nine? Um, I, I think that uh, if there's a low surface area, if it wanted to drag itself, Okay. And it's got a lot of joints that can put out a lot of power. It can pull itself. Yeah, it's got a lot of joints. So you'll notice number nine and number eight as well. These ones are more or less going to drag part of their body along the ground. And again, we're not selecting for energy efficiency, so maybe that doesn't matter. But friction also slows you down. It also You also take a hit in terms of overall speed, generally speaking. Yeah. A lot, you have a long stride, though. You get a lot of, a lot of distance between... They might have a long stride, you're right? Like, for example, robot number 10, the tripod in the middle there, right? It's got the longest vertical legs. It should be able to take longer strides than the other nine robots, which may play to its benefit. Anybody else want to place any bets before we carry on? Are we considering st stability at all? Because it seems to me like a three-legged robot would have a lot less stability than ah. a quadruped. So this is an important point. We are not directly selecting for stability in the fitness function. But if 99% of the controllers that evolution tries out on a robot fall over, then evolution is going to have a harder time finding fast moving robots. You remember our discussion about fitness landscapes, where sometimes you have more or less hills, which makes it difficult for evolution to travel. The fitness landscape for uh, upright tripedal or bipedal locomotion is extremely rugged. Evolution might be able to discover uh, a controller that gets the robot to take one or maybe two steps before falling over. And the child controller of that robot, there's a slight change to the synaptic weight. The child robot might not even be able to achieve those one or two steps. It might fall over immediately. Very difficult to train neural networks for bipedal robots, which is one of the reasons why humanoid robots have been a dream of roboticists for a long time, and they are still not a reality. We have the Roomba, but not the Atlas humanoid robot yet. Any other guesses? Uh, six seems like a good contender. How come? It has six legs, okay. so it should be fairly stable when it's lifting up a leg. Okay. Um, and uh, it can lift its body off the ground. Exactly. So six is not dragging any part of the body of its body along the ground. It's got six legs, so it's generally stable and has six more or less vertically aligned legs. 
There's lots of six-legged animals that are very successful on this planet. Not a, not a bad guess. Yes? I think as long as seven doesn't fall over, it can get moved really fast. Possibly. So seven is built, if you look carefully, seven has short cylindrical feet, which makes sure that it won't fall over. So that's a possibility. Won't your experiment be affected by your choice of evolutionary algorithm? What if your algorithm is just not good enough to evolve the six-legged ones, but two-legged ones? A absolutely, right? So what we've mapped out here is a very difficult research paradigm because, of course, if one of these robots, if we are able to evolve one of these robots better than the other, it's probably a function not just of the morphology, but the particular evolutionary algorithm. So there are more trade-offs here than we're going to actually look at. We're just going to ask the question for a given evolutionary algorithm. Can we try and isolate in any effect that morphology has on locomotion? All right, let's carry on. What you're looking at here is uh, the 10 best controllers evolved for each of the 10 robots, 1 through 10. And we're visualizing the gates produced by these robots using a footprint graph. So let's have a look at a footprint graph. For each individual panel here, we're playing back the movement of just one robot. Each row in the panel corresponds to one object that came into contact with the ground. Usually that's one of the robot's feet, but it could be that the robot fell over and it's some other object that comes into contact with the ground. So we observe the robot operating in the simulator. We see that seven, seven, seven separate objects came into contact with the ground. So we create a footprint graph with seven rows, and off we go. Each column corresponds to one time step during the simulation. So we ran these simulations for 500 uh, time steps. At each position inside this panel, the x and y coordinate, we paint that pixel black if that object was in contact with the ground at that point in time, and we paint that pixel white if that object was not in contact with the ground at that point in time. So far, so good. Footprint graphs are very useful for those of you that are working on your final projects already. It's a great way to visualize the particular gate that your robot has discovered or that evolution has discovered without having to show a video. You can also see a fair bit more in a footprint graph than you can by just watching a video of one of these simulated robots. What is it? What can you tell me about the evolved gates, the 10 best evolved gates for these 10 different robots? They're periodic. They're periodic. Are they all periodic? Not quite. Some are more periodic than others. What does that tell you? What would you expect for the robots that are traveling with a cleaner oscillation than the other robots? I guess more dynamic stability. Maybe dynamically st stable. It's hard to actually tell from the cleanness of the oscillation. Consistent behavior. It's consistent, of course, because it's oscillating. <coughs> what does that consistency, consistency translate into? Exactly. So if you're stumbling around, generally speaking, you're not going to travel as far as something that has fallen into a very sharp rhythm and is able to repeat that over and over again. So one of the things that the footprint graph does not show you is the actual displacement achieved by these robots. It's showing you the gait, which is not quite the same as displacement, but there are some relationships. What else can you tell me about these gates? Exactly. So you can tell something about, obviously, how many legs or how many objects are in contact with the ground or not, which is called what? Flight. The flight phase or the uh, stance phase. Which of these robots that I have zoomed in here have a flight phase? Yes? No. Go ahead. Uh, five, seven, and eight. Five, seven. Does seven have a flight phase in there? Mm -hmm. Maybe, somewhere. <laughs> and what was the other one? Five, seven, and? Eight. And eight. Yes, eight for sure has a, a flight phase, right? So you can learn quite a bit about how these 
uh, robots are moving. What do you think the relationship is between existence of flight phase or amount of flight phase during the gate cycle and displacement? You would, you would expect that the more, the, the greater the flight phase, the faster the robot is moving. That is certainly true for our mode of locomotion. There's no flight phase in walking, but there is in running, and we can run faster than we can walk. Is that necessarily true, though, for these robots? What m else might be happening during the flight phase? Could be falling over, possibly. If it fell over, though, you definitely see it in the footprint graph. could be bouncing up and down, right? Doesn't necessarily mean that it's a forward, uh, a forward jump. It could be moving up and down more than it is moving forward. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at some videos. Here's uh, the best controller for robot six, the six-legged robot. four-legged robot. The worm. I mentioned at the beginning of last class peristaltic motion which is compression and expansion of muscle uh, bundles along the length of the animal. We also have that in our throat when we swallow. This is another variant of peristaltic motion. This is not expansion or compression, but obviously you have more or less a traveling wave. It's not perfect, but it's there, traveling from the front of the robot towards the back, which produces forward motion for a while until there's a traffic jam at the front of the robot. What was your fitness function here? Were you uh, having some additional constraints other than the displacement? Or? Just displacement. Move forward as quickly as possible over 500 time steps. Here's the tripe tripedal robot. Anybody walked on crutches before? That's true. Huh? This one, not so much. Not as clean an oscillation as the others, but it's there. At least temporarily. Was it, was it total distance or in a particular dimension? What, what, what axis? Uh, for, uh, forward travel, whatever that is. I always forget. Maximum Y. I would have liked to see um, something like the, the robot on the lower right, but with two sets of legs on either side, like a centipede or a millipede, because those are very stable and also some of the fastest creatures compared to their size. Absolutely, right? So you could imagine many more than, than these 10. I picked these 10 somewhat arbitrarily. You could, again, for a final project, you could go back and try and replicate part of this experiment and try out other body plans. Anybody want to revise their bets before we move on? No? Okay. All right, I've hopefully kept you in suspense for long enough. Here's our uh, fitness, our 10 fitness curves. So now we're plotting on the horizontal axis evolutionary time, 200 generations. As you've probably experienced by now, during the first few generations, there is very rapid evolutionary prog progress. Because if you're starting with random controllers and random gates, there are a huge number of mutations that will do better than chance. But as evolution starts to improve these gates and discover a particular form of oscillation and then subsequently clean up that oscillation, it gets harder and harder for slight random changes to the synaptic weights to further improve the gate. Who won? Six more or less. I, I neglected to put error bars on here, so we can't really be sure, but clearly six, two, and three seem to be doing better than everyone else. You'll notice the particular shape of the curve for robot number six is somewhat different from the others. I didn't quite get all 30 runs for number six, so we've got to take that with a bit of grain of, 
of salt. But generally speaking, there is clearly a difference. Five and seven did the worst. So there's six, six, two, and three did the best. So those that voted for the, quadru the hexapod and the quadruped, well done. Uh, and five and seven, the two worm robots did the worst. Why did five and seven do particularly poorly? Could it have something to do maybe with the reality gap? Didn't we see that like something in Pyrosim just standing straight up would fall over eventually? Possibly, that's why I put these cylindrical feet on robots five and seven so that it cannot fall over to the left or right. So actually, five and seven are just as stable as the other eight. All right, could it have to do with the traffic jam that kept happening? Would it catch in the front? It catches at the front. So again, this particular uh, neural network may not be very appropriate for evolving peristaltic motion, right? So five and seven have a lot of feet or a lot of legs that they have to orchestrate. And that may be difficult to do with this particular neural network. So there is a question about what happens if we change the evolutionary algorithm. What happens if we create a different kind of neural network? Perhaps that different neural network will favor five and seven over the other eight robots. Again, that's something we haven't studied yet, but that might be, be the case. Okay, so number six um, did particularly well, again, for the reasons that were already mentioned. We have a lot of vertically angled legs that can swing and get relatively large gates, large amplitude steps. The tripod can get, tripod can get even higher amplitude steps, but it has to rest, evolution has to wrestle with stability. Six legs is a pretty good solution. You're pretty stable uh, most of the time. And obviously, that's a successful strategy uh, in nature. OK. So however, that's all anecdotal. Can we try and zoom in and, and actually figure out which features of the morphology affect whether evolution is able to produce fast gates for that robot or not? So I did that by looking at different features. The first one was the total mass of the robot. The more mass that you have, the heavier you are, that might slow you down depending on how you move. Or alternatively, like us, you can use your forward momentum to keep moving even if there's a little bit of a traffic jam or if you, if you stub your toe and so on. All of the objects that make up the robots uh, have the same mass, one kilogram. So the total number of objects here dictates the total mass. So robot number one here uh, is made up of 15 pieces. Robot number four is made up of 17 pieces and so on. So I took the 10 robots and I reordered them on the horizontal axis from lightest robot to heaviest robot. The vertical axis shows the mean distance traveled by the 30 best controllers from the 30 runs for that robot. So basically, the higher the bar, the easier it was for evolution to find fast moving gates for that robot. Is there a relationship between mass and speed? Not really. There's a general trend going down here, but there are clearly exceptions to the rule. So total mass is not a sufficient predictor of how easy or hard it will be for evolution to train these robots. The next one has to do with stability. So I looked at points of contact. So the robot number 10 is the tripod, which has three points of contact with the ground. And over here, we have robots five and seven, the two worm robots. And each of those worm robots has these 10 cylindrical feet that can come into contact with the ground. Question? I was just wondering if um, the distance the robots traveled was like scaled to their size. It was not. We just, took the, uh, we just took the total distance traveled. The robots are more or less the same size. Not quite, but generally speaking. Oops. Does total number of points of contact predict how easy or hard it will be for evolution? There's not to be an optimal point. Here. There seems to be an optimal point, right? So too few feet, too few feet, and you tend to fall over most of the time which makes for a rugged fitness landscape, hard for evolution to search. 
too many points of contact and evolution has to work hard to coordinate the movement of all of those feet so the robot doesn't trip over itself. There seems to be this sweet spot in the middle around four or six points of contact. Most higher animals and insects move with four or six points of contact with the ground, with the notable exception of our species. In later uh, studies, did you repeat this with eight legs? No, but that would be a great thing to, to try. We haven't done that yet. Do you think that the, the type of evolutionary algorithm you use might have an effect on which uh, robots perform better? Uh, a little bit, but I think this general principle is still going to hold up, right? That, that you're still going to, it might get easier for evolution to uh, search the, uh, the low point of contact robot landscape, the rugged fitness landscape, because better evolutionary algorithms can deal with lots of local optima but whether uh, they would improve the ability to find controllers for the tripod as well as the other ones, I imagine this asymmetry is still gonna hold up. We, if you replace this evolutionary algorithm with a better one or even something other than an evolutionary algorithm, that more powerful search method is probably gonna do an even better job of finding faster gates for the four and six point of contact robots. Although I haven't tested that, I don't know, it'd be an interesting thing to try. Okay, last thing I looked at, and then we'll move on in the last 15 minutes to bipedal locomotion, was the neural network. So the neural network that we used, uh, the network, neural network that we used here, as I showed you before, has three hidden neurons. They're recurrent connections, so these robots have a little bit uh, of memory. The light gray bars that you see here is the mean distance traveled by the best controllers for the 10 robots with that neural network I just showed you. We did another 300 evolutionary trials, 30 of robot one, 30 of robot two, and so on, with the same neural network, but now five hidden neurons. We added some more hidden neuron material and re-ran the robots, and we looked at the mean distance traveled by the robots with this larger neural network represented by the dark gray bars. What happened? They perform better. They perform better. So how many hidden neurons do we need for these robots? Who knows, but three generally seem to be too little. Why did the additional hidden neurons help? Which robots did the larger neural network help more? Yep. Uh, seven, especially. seven especially, which is maybe not too surprising because seven is the one that was doing the worst to begin with. The ones with more legs. Remember that seven, or five and seven, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction here. Remember, five and seven are the two worm robots. So when we added in this additional, these additional hidden neurons, it got easier for evolution to coordinate the motion of all of those legs, which seems to support this intuition we just had that you need a larger neural network or at least a different neural network to coordinate the motion of all those legs. So now there is a relationship not just between the anatomy of the robot and how hard or easy it is for evolution to find a fast-moving gait for that robot. There's a relationship also now between body optimization and brain, the controller. Again, not so surprising. There are interrelationships between all of these things. In this study, we were primarily focusing on differences caused by the body. Okay, so yes, clearly there is a difference here. Generally speaking, the robots do better with five hidden neuron networks than others. Evolution is able to exploit that additional material. And it's more useful for robots five and seven, presumably because those additional two hidden neurons allow evolution to discover controllers that better coordinate the motion of all of those body parts. 
Okay. So we started this lecture on locomotion by saying there are these trade-offs between these different aspects of motion. And now we've ended this lecture by evolving robots. And surprise, surprise, we're rediscovering all of these trade-offs. Depending on the neural network we choose, the evolutionary algorithm we choose, and the robot we choose, we're going to make things easier or harder for evolution to make progress. Any questions about that before we move on? Scott. Ever do anything with, with monitoring whether the body is you know, being dragged along the touch sensor in the, in, the, in the frame? We have not. So, do we look at whether things are being dragged or not? We, uh, alligator versus uh, dog. We, we could, and we're going to see that in the next lecture when we look at bipedal locomotion. One of the things that we don't do most of the time is drag our feet, right? Okay, let's move on. Bipedal locomotion, you've all spent several decades experiencing this form of locomotion, so you're all experts on this subject, right? You know where this is going, right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Thinking about bipedal locomotion, also somewhat strange. We all walk and run. Why two gates? Why not three? Why not one? Uh, clearly, there are lots of different ways that you can move if you have two legs. And the greatest demonstrator of this fact of all time will show us this fact. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're all welcome to try this on the way to your next class. <laughs> all right, this is the one class in which we're going to do a little bit of political science. Um, in the UK, the government is arranged into ministries. There are a vast number of ministries. So somewhere within Whitehall, there must be a ministry of silly walks. They, the UK government has a ministry for everything. So there must be a ministry of silly walks. Some ministers have walks that are more silly than others. We're all laughing because, of course, it's Monty Python. But why else are you laughing? It's breaking expectations, right? You can imagine that John Cleese probably broke out in a sweat while he was doing this. Very energy inefficient ways to move. Skipping is another. Uh variation on the theme of uh, Absolutely, yeah, which, which work perfectly fine, but again, not as energy efficient as our bread and butter, walking and running. Do you use your upper body during locomotion? How so? You move your torso, right? How do you move your torso while walking? Not quite. People like position their upper body like forward when they're climbing up hills. There's also that. What, are, what are, when you're walking uphill, obviously you angle your body forward. Why? So you, don't stand backwards. Okay. so you don't fall backwards. Let's use some of the terminology we just Keep went through. Center of mass over your, over your gait. You're keeping your center of mass over your polygon of support, right? So obviously, if you're walking on an incline, your body is orthogonal to the surface over which you're moving, which means generally speaking, your center of mass is further towards the back of your polygon of support, and you'll fall over backwards unless you lean forward. How else do we use our upper body during locomotion? Um, I was going to further on what you were saying. So go ahead. That's fine. Um, so you said to keep your uh, centered mass over your polygon of support. Then you also said that when you're in at a gate, it's like statically so like if so you're running and you've got the flying statically you, unstable you're statically yeah. unstable you don't have you don't have a polygon of support yet you still want to keep your center of mass over what would you call that you want to keep your center of mass close to a future polygon of support 
which is the foot that's going to hit the ground in about half a second's time. Right? You probably all have this experience. You're running, your foot comes down, and your center of mass is very far away from your foot, and you either grind to a halt or you stumble over your, your leg. So even in a, dy a statically unstable mode of locomotion like running, we're trying to keep our center of mass close to where our polygon of support, even when we don't have a polygon of support. Well, just, just complicating the, the way that you sometimes bend forward when you're going uphill. It also has to do with uh, the, the range of your, your muscles and ligaments. You can't, when, you, when you're sort of upright and leaning forward, you need more hip flexor. That's true. Um, flexibility and also you just sort of may not be as strong in that range. Uh, absolutely, right? So like anything in biomechanics, the story always gets more complicated. It's not just these four different objectives that we're trying to strike a balance with. There are other physiological limitations as well. Yes? Are you trying to swing our arms with our legs? So like if you swing your left leg forward, your right arm is going to move forward? Exactly. You tend to swing your arms, your contralateral arm with your leg. When your left leg is moving forward, you swing your right arm forward. Why? Do it uh, kind of throws your mass forward? Not quite. Again, leaning forward and, and walking quickly is enough for that. Counterbalancing. You're counterbalancing in what way? You're counterbalancing something, I mean your body, but what aspect of counterbalancing is occurring when you swing your leg, your contralateral arm with your leg? Um, maybe you like <laughs> aligning your torso with where you're going. More or less, right? So we're keeping our torso fa facing forward as we move. Why? Why not walk or run like this? Um, so we can see where we're going. Part of it is to see where we're going, right? So there is, again, a relationship now, not just between biomechanics, but our perceptual system. There is yet one more reason why we swing our arms to keep our torso facing forward. It's more energy efficient, not quite. You're actually, you're canceling out a rotation. So you're using energy to cancel a rotation which is not energy efficient. Um, so you kind of just have the same starting point so you can have that like more um, symmetrical like oscillation so you, like, you don't have like different starting points, I guess. Maybe, yes. It has to do with the momentum, right? So especially when you're running at high speeds, your torso is trying to accelerate rotationally to the left and to the right, right? Rotation about your long axis, which makes sense. You're throwing a significant fraction of your weight on one side forward, which induces rotational acceleration counterclockwise in this case. If you do that, you'll spin around and fall on your back, right? So you're using your arms to cancel that out, which means you take a hit in terms of energy, but you recover stability, right? You can run without spinning and falling down. Okay, so lots of things going on in terms of bipedal locomotion. Let's switch from John Cleese now to uh, Honda's Asimo robot. So it was one of the first humanoid robots that exhibited uh, relatively fast locomotion. You're all laughing again, of course, and you now know why you're laughing. What's so funny about Asimov? He's skulking. He's skulking, all right, we have a, another gate here. So you say that we lose energy, uh, but we gain stability through using our arms. That's right. Is the fact that our arms exist and that we, like, like let's say that like I, I wanted to gain efficiency, I'm a distance marathon runner. And okay. I'm, should I hold my arms to the ground, like to the, my sides? Like, we, you don't, can, we don't see that. You can try it. If you hold your arms to your side, you're, you're going to be pretty unstable. You're right. probably going to slow down to keep your stability. I think we're missing is the, 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 the pendulum. You're not taking good use of the, that sort of pogoing or the you, levering over the. We've mentioned this before, which is one of the main benefits of bipedal locomotion. The, the leading hypothesis for why our ancestors evolved two-legged gates is that it's extremely energy efficient. 
half of the gait cycle, your leg is off the ground and you're relaxing a lot of the mus muscles in your leg and your leg is passively rotating forward for you. You tense your muscles when your foot comes into contact with the ground. You obviously, I'm not showing you any time series data here of energy expenditure in Asimo, but you can visually see it, right? Asimo is not swinging its feet forward, which means what? It's quote unquote walking. It's got to actively move that leg. This is an extremely energy inefficient way to move. What do you think is in Asimo's backpack there? Battery. A battery, exactly. This is extremely energy inefficient, but it's energy inefficient, but they, they, by paying that price of energy inefficiency, they buy stability. In the slow motion videos they were showing back here, you'll notice that this is running, there's a flight phase, it's very brief, and most of the time Asimo keeps its center of mass over the polygon of support described by the single foot that's in contact with the ground at any one time. So it looks kind of like running, but it's not running, right? It's just fast walking, more or less. Okay, so uh, again, at this time, the time that Asimo was released, this was a real engineering feat, an incredible robot at the time, but the engineers made a very extreme trade-off between stability, speed, and, and gait. Right? We are going to spend the rest of lecture 12 looking at a, ro a set of robots that exist at the opposite spectrum, and these are known as the passive dynamic walkers, and I think we'll end with this today. This is one of the first passive dynamic walkers. It also walks, but very, very differently from the way that Asimo does. Tell me about this passive dynamic walker. It's got the pendulum legs like we do, right? This form of walking looks much more natural, much more anthropomorphic like our way of walking. How much energy is this robot using or expending during walking? It doesn't look like it has a battery at all. It doesn't look like it has a battery at all. This robot has no batteries, no motors, no sensors, no neural network whatsoever. This is not actually a robot, it's just a mechanical mechanism. There are toys that you can get like this, how can something without a brain or motors or sensors walk? What's the trick? Gravity, Gravity is a part of this, but not enough. You, gotta give it like a starting push or something. you give it a little bit of a starting push, not too is, much. Is There's that, a little bit of a tap. Is that platform flat or angled downward? The platform is angled downward. So this is a mechanism that's been designed that turns potential energy into kinetic energy, back to high school physics, right? We start this robot at a height, and then because of gravity, it starts to rock forward and accelerate. And that acceleration, if you have just the right curvature on the soles of your feet, like this robot does, and everything else is just right, if you get the body right, you can get maximally energy efficient walking. No energy expenditure whatsoever. Very extreme trade-off. So what problems is our passive dynamic walker going to face? Trips. Where does it take a hit somewhere else? Didn't trip. You didn't see it fall over. Yeah, obstacles, obstacles in its environment were over which it could trip. Very moves pretty quickly. Energy efficient. It's got to take a hit somewhere else in the other two uh, aspects. Terrain. Robustness to terrain. This passive dynamic walker can only walk on its plank. You put another plank there at another angle, it's not happy. Its ecological niche is extremely narrow. We'll pick up our discussion on uh, this passive dynamic walker on Thursday. You have a quiz due tonight. I will see you on Thursday. Thank you.